<laughs> um, Mary Graham, hello. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. We just got done talking to Kayla Cottingham. We sure did. An acquaintance, a friend of yours. Um, Indeed. We were at library school together in Boston. Now a published author with her debut novel, My Dearest Darkest, which is a horror novel, which you had a good time reading. I had a good time reading it. I, like, not a horror person. Yeah. So, dear listener, wherever you fall on the yes horror, no horror spectrum, please know that I, a noted Frady Cat, really, really enjoyed this novel and did not even have to keep the lights on when I went to sleep. That's good. You're listening to A Little Too Quiet. It's the Ferndale Library Podcast. And it's brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library. And uh, let's, we had a great chat with, with Kayla. And I wanted to just go over this book, which is about a girl. She plays the piano. She's uh, auditioning. She wants to go to a school and uh, has a car accident. Parents die, drown, water. She survives. Or, or does she? Does she? <laughs> she meets Selena at school. Is... It's not attracted to her, but... Uh, no, but it's compelled. Compelled. There is something compelling about her. I dare say enchanted, but that's still not the right word. She. They don't like each other enough they don't, at first. They don't like each other. They have a bad... They have a rough first impression meeting. They find out that the... Well, the kids at the school, they like to go down to the tunnels, as it were, which we talk about. And uh, they like to sometimes interact with uh, a friendly ghost, maybe. Or is it? Named Nerosi. These girls start to, I guess, ask things of Nerosi, but there's a price involved for any sort of, I say, I say on the podcast that she grants wishes, and that's not exactly it. But Mary Graham, again, this is not typically a genre you read. No. What did you think of this book? I, I think Compelled is like not unlike Finch the first time she meets Selena she is like what is going on but I can't look away Um, and that is how I felt especially once I hit the halfway point of this book I I could not put it down I was like I've got to know what's going on I've got to know how all these pieces fit together Mm -hmm. and I found it just immensely satisfying and I'm honestly wondering if like cosmic horror because I've I've also started reading N.K. Jemisin's The City We Became and I'm really enjoying it um, and that is also cosmic horror. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if like this is maybe the horror genre for me because the things that frighten me are all very realistic. Mm-hmm. Like I don't I'm just like, oh, I just don't go into the tunnels under my apartment building. As far as I know, there are no tunnels under my apartment building. But if there were, mm-hmm. as far as I don't go there, probably I will not meet an Aldrich horror. I think cosmic horror is the underdog. It's it's. It lends itself to rich metaphorical applications. And that's, I think, exactly the thing is that, like, the philosophy of this book, mm-hmm. like, the, the meaning, the metaphor, there's so much there that I really enjoyed that I was like, okay, the tentacles mm-hmm. are not the scary part for me. Which... The representation, of, like, the, the meaning of the, the creature with the tentacles society is is much scarier and there's part of me that's like yes thank you for saying that being a teenage girl is terrifying absolutely (laughs) so yeah definitely really really enjoyed this book i really enjoyed this conversation and uh we'll start off with a reunion because mary graham and kayla are old friends so here is our chat Kayla, it's good to meet you. Yeah, it's good to meet you as well. I'm Jeff, as you get into it. Uh, we just waved at each other through Zoom, and I really think that that was both charming of both <laughs> of us to do that, even though we can see each other. <laughs> I still, like, physically raise my hand well, during I'm... Zoom meetings sometimes to be like, excuse me. <laughs> it's really hard to deprogram yourself from that. And also, like, I'm not going to go searching for the little hand raisey thing. I'm going to be like, you can see my face. My hand is up. Look, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> we're all in our little boxes yes exactly <laughs> yes well it's so good to see you again for the listener at home kayla and i were library school classmates and when your book came out i was like going around work being like my friend wrote a book and i said moreover we did group projects together and she always pulled her weight like <laughs> like to me i was like i'm very proud of the fact that she wrote a book more importantly she didn't let me down when we had to lead that gentleman's guide to vice and virtue book club <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. oh, and like the lib guide that we did on historical fiction, oh I think to this day is still um, one of the better group projects I did. Yeah, one of, certainly one of the best lib guides I've ever done. She spoke very, high, very highly of you. Yes, indeed. 
And then oh, one of the next things she said, since Mary Graham knows that I like Halloween and then by extension horror, she was like, my friend also wrote a horror novel. So congrats on your horror novel, My Dearest Darkest. Thank you. I feel like I should grab it off the shelf. But then I was like, this is an audio medium. We have it here. <laughs> it is, and yet we both still have our library copy. Yes. <laughs> okay. I actually pulled this off of our YA shelf yesterday to like review it before this podcast and we have a new adult services librarian who at his last job was a teen librarian i pulled off the shelf he goes oh he's like i don't want to spoil it but like lesbians with body parts yeah. and i was like yes <laughs> yes simon yes <laughs> i was like that's i feel like that's on the back copy that's not a spoiler <laughs> <laughs> yeah no we do be losing organs at times in this one but <laughs> which so i love actually that we're both here because jeff is a horror fan and i'm very much not a horror person and i could not put this book down that's true that's, that's... <laughs> like, oh, nice. <laughs> i was especially once we got to the part with like the echoes so any any sort of like time I can't swear on this podcast, like screwing around with time or um, like when, when it was like, oh, that was the band a cult. I was like, was it? I have to know. Like, <laughs> At about the halfway point, I was like, cancel all my appointments. I have to figure out how, what happens with the body parts. So, <laughs> you can, go, you you can go ahead and swear on this really podcast. My heart. <laughs> OK, you, you can go ahead and swear. We'll just bleep it. And okay. it'll make us sound that much more edgy. Brilliant. Anything to do with time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was something that I came up with in one of the very early drafts. And I there used to be a little bit more of like a time travel -y element where at one point they were like talking to um, these people in the past and they were like, oh, we talked to your future selves and one of you is dead in the future. It was like a whole thing. And my editor was like, you've got to scale back. This is way too big, Kayla. Well, because I noticed in the you know acknowledgement, she mentioned that some some form of this story has existed at least in your head for like a decade a decade and so i'm sure that that like i was even thinking as i finished it because something that i really admired and i was just talking about this with a coworker yesterday is that i think in my experience with some of the ya i've read recently there's a tendency to do a lot in one book and and i had someone recommend a book to me recently and he said, I liked this because even though it's doing so much, it pulls it off. And I said, oh, OK, because like one of the reasons I haven't picked this up yet is I read the cover copy and I was like, that sounds like there's a lot going on. And something that I loved about this book is that in a sense, there is because of like the sort of cryptid research they're doing and, and the bit with killing Howard and the band and stuff like that. But on the other hand, I was like, this is a pretty straightforward, like kind of monster of the week or monster of the school year story. Yeah, Which you know. I really, really enjoyed. Accidentally summoning a creature, you know, as Who's one does. Among us in high school. And like, am I remembering correctly that you did some time you did some time in like all girls high school? So I it wasn't all girls, but I did briefly attend um a boarding school in New Zealand for three months, um, where I was a foreign exchange student and so I stayed in the like I, I lived with a host family, but I spent a lot of time in the dorms. Um, and then I also had my best friend go to Wellesley here in Massachusetts, which Ululum takes like a ton of inspiration from Wellesley. It's basically just Wellesley light um, mm -hmm. with like the tunnels and everything under the school is very much just plugged directly from that. Now that you're saying that, so I did do time i did four whole years at an all-girls high school it was not a boarding <laughs> school but i had moments reading this where i was like oh she's absolutely nailed the like girls dynamics because i would have people say to me you know when i said oh i go to all girls high school they would say oh like do you all hate each other is it constantly like catty and back sabby and i was like no not constantly <laughs> like there were like there were like 500 of us like y'all have different opinions on on different people so i liked that there were like the group dynamics of this were so perfectly like yeah girls have really close friendships and relationships with girls also some girls are terrible mm -hmm. and are really <laughs> mean to each other but i i actually looked at wellesley briefly for college and ended up thinking i don't want to do four more years of all girls education um but the tunnels were something that like got mentioned and i had a friend who went there and so that was somewhere in the dark recesses of my mind thank you for reminding me yeah <laughs> it was that was my favorite thing about visiting my friend at wellesley was going to the the tunnels which you're not supposed to do um 
<laughs> if anyone listening to this podcast is like, I go to Wellesley, I should go to the tunnels. Don't think that this is me endorsing it. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. There's asbestos down there. You're not supposed to do that. There's asbestos and like, frankly, after reading this book, who knows what other eldritch horrors. So consider if <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what you want to spend your sophomore year of college dealing with. <laughs> as if you know finals aren't enough yeah and like going to school your nails getting ripped off while covid is still happening i think we should let the listener know that it is often common for a book to be evolving over years it's not not everyone has a cottage industry uh james patterson just churning them all out but I am this so... is a james patterson critical podcast it absolutely is <laughs> Um, oh, good. <laughs> I'm so curious as to if you took us back to like the, the earliest incarnation of this, what kind of a story was it? Was it, did you want to tell a cosmic horror story? Did you want to tell a, a boarding school story? Did you want to tell a, a YA story, a teens, teen girls dealing with pressure story? What, what was its earliest incarnation, I guess? How did it evolve? I love this question because it's it's such a funny How did answer. we get to so, tentacles? <laughs> yeah, let's say there were a good number of steps before we got there. So I wrote the very first incarnation of this when I was 15 years old. Um, so it's been 11 years at this point. And it was originally very inspired by the MTV show Teen Wolf, um, which... <laughs> The, One of my the absolute violent favorites. Tumblr flashbacks I'm having at the moment. Yeah. Because that's the thing about Tumblr is you don't have to be in the thing. Like, I never watched Teen Wolf, but oh my god, the, what you absorb by osmosis. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was a really bananas time. <laughs> and like, so I was obsessed with it. And I think that honestly, if you have seen Teen Wolf and you read the book, you can definitely see the influence of that still. But so it's very earliest incarnation. It was the werewolf story. Um, so that's why Selena's name is Selena, because in it, I was like, ooh, moon name <laughs> for my because she was a werewolf. Um, oh. And then Finch was the sort of genre savvy classic. Like she was a little bit more of my self insert of like, I'm I'm super nerdy and I love this sort of thing. And so she was sort of the like man in the chair essentially for Selena's werewolf tomfoolery. And then Simon was like a fairy prince from the never, never. It was a bananas first concept. Wow. <laughs> um, and then Kira was still, um, she was still the antagonist, but she was also a werewolf. Um, and the big reveal at the end was like, she was the one who turned Selena. So that was a whole, Wow. Um, a whole thing. Ultimately, what wound up happening is I liked the characters from that so much that I just kind of kept sticking them in new books over the course of 10 years until roughly 2016 rolled around. And I had been reading a fair amount of Lovecraft. And this is before I realized that Lovecraft was like the absolute hideous person right. in, like, in history, basically. I mean, there's also the other terrible people, obviously, but in terms of writers, he's up there in terms of the worst. And so I quickly realized that I was like, this guy sucks. I want to read more stuff that's in the cosmic horror genre, but not written by this person whose work is so defined by his like intense bigotry. And that's when I found more like recent cosmic horror, which a lot of which is by um, people in marginalized communities. And it focuses a lot more on the existential horror of being the other as opposed to being afraid of the other essentially so that's kind of the the, sh the long short pitch of how i got from werewolves to tentacle monsters <laughs> that's amazing and like i'm i'm not saying that i think the book is less for any of the things that you know happen in revisions please write a werewolf book someday i want to oh, read it so badly so bad. well, I, but also because like i've been thinking about how it's personally so strange to me this tale type about a normal human person becoming like this monstrous thing once a month is not how do we not have a million adolescent girl stories about that because I'm yeah. like, I think actually perhaps if I had had a werewolf story when I was 15 and missing school because of my cramps, I think that would have fixed me. <laughs> it was, well, there's one of my, so I love like culty, like horror films, not like horror films about cults. Yes. But like, you know, cult classics. And one of my absolute favorites is one from, I think, 2001. It's called um, Ginger Snaps. I was hoping and you'd bring it up. 
Yeah, it's it's about like a teenage girl who essentially gets turned into a werewolf, and it's very much tied to like um, she also gets like her period at the same time, and it's very obviously like a, a puberty metaphor, but it's done super super well, and it's got that really classic campy horror humor to it, which is my like absolutely my favorite thing. Which Jennifer's body was a big influence on this book, um, and so I think I tried to emulate a little bit of the humor from that as well and i mean i found it to be a very funny book and i think like the dialogue is so perfectly spot on um and uh, jennifer's body is another one of those things that like i actually haven't seen the film but i've absorbed some of it via tumblr and i think there's a scene where like selena blows a bubble with her gum like while looking straight at finch and i was like i feel like that's a jennifer's body reference (laughs) (laughs) with the with the bubble gum um i'm really glad that you brought up selena's name because i was actually going to ask you how you picked some of these (laughs) names um because initially when i was reading i was like oh selena i mean in terms of sound it's not that far off from like regina like regina george because she is in some ways also that like kind of classic mean girl and and i liked that it didn't feel i personally didn't think that it felt cheap you know when it sort of when that facade kind of falls away and you're like oh selena's actually like a, a deeply caring person um you know, I was like, that's that's just so I thought it was just really well done. So woohoo for that. Um, but I thought all of the names were so interesting, especially Neurosi. I was like, oh, it's so perfect. And it made me think of like necrosis. And I things was going like to say that. that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so I just I was if you have any more name behind the <laughs> name stories that you feel like sharing, I'm always fascinated by those. The name lore. Yeah. So Neurosi, um, I, yeah, I did get from like Necrosis. That was very much the the inspiration. And, and which is funny because a lot of people are like, oh, is it supposed to be Neurosis? Right. Like, like sort of a mental illness thing. And I was like, I was going for rotting. Um, but it does, I mean, it's still, it's got that ominous feeling to it either way where it's like something is wrong. Um, at one point, my dad made a joke where he was like, oh, was psychosis taken? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dad, please. <laughs> but um, so that's where that one came from. Finch was in the very first version of the book. Her name was Eliana, which I had Googled because it meant sun. Um, sun, moon. Of course. Uh-huh. I, would just, I would just want to note in the first version, they weren't gay, but it was very much written so that like a very proto-sapphic relationship, which makes sense because I wasn't out at that point. D- is it one of those things that you look back? Because like I look at things that I wrote before I realized I was bi and I look back on it now and I'm like, oh, uh-huh. we didn't know oh, things yes. about ourselves yet, but that expli- but we also sort of knew things about ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> so- well, early Finch and Selena still went to prom together and like bought each other corsages and stuff and I was like you know like besties do. <laughs> just gals being pals just gals being pals <laughs> going to prom um, together <laughs> holding hands and at one point they make a comment where they're like we would make such a cute lesbian couple <laughs> <laughs> I just look back on it where I'm like oh my god you were this close to realizing kid <laughs> But yeah, I think the other name that I do really like is is Finch because I wanted her to have um, a name that sort of reflected her personality where like, you know, I think a bird name summons the imagery of something that's kind of small and delicate um, and like, but very, you know, they're they're sturdy in a weird way, a Finch. um, They're everywhere. They're all over the globe. They've managed to, you know, make their home pretty much everywhere but they're still this sort of they're so cute and puffy so hence how i came up with bitch <laughs> but it sounds like you started with wolves and then we got towards this this book for me was almost not bait and switch but i was like oh ghosts but no and mm-hmm. then we get into the true cosmic horror the true stuff, cosmic horror but is... there is that tease of oh is it ghosts yeah is it echoes hmm mm-hmm. no but Let's talk about ghosts and tell us more about the band and kind of that and how we get into the history of the island, librarians helping with the history of the island. Anyway, tell us how, <laughs> tell us how you got to the ghosts and, and the band. Yeah, um, so I knew that I wanted there to be this sort of, um, pardon the pun, specter looming over um, the... <laughs> what you don't the know whole... about Jeff, Kayla, because you don't work with him, is that puns yeah. are a daily 
frequent occurrence here, and many times on the podcast has a pun been made where I want to storm out of the room that we're sitting in, but I can't because I'm wearing my headphones and there's a lot of yep. wires happening. Yep. And <laughs> so please know that you have made Jeff's day. Yeah. And I'm going to make one before the podcast is over. So continue. Oh, okay. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm in a, a, a pun safe environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I wanted there to be that sort of like urban legend feeling to it where something had happened in the past where people are still talking about it years later but it was sort of covered up and shoved under the rug and so there's it's a little bit hard to find proof about it basically where i wanted it to be like everyone knows about it but no one can prove it sort of that vibe to it in the way that i think that rumors can circulate in small communities like that um and then i wanted to write an emo band specifically from like 2004 because I was an emo kid when I was um, in like middle and high school. I had a chain wallet and I wore all black all the time, not shockingly. And so I was like, I'll just sort of take my interest in, um, in pop punk and just make it a little bit evil, much in the same way they kind of do in Jennifer's body. but I also wanted it to, I wanted there to be enough of a story there that they felt like their own characters in the past to the point where if, if I were ever given the opportunity, I'd love to write a prequel um, about killing Howard because I had so much fun coming up with them and writing about like Margot and Victor and company. But that was very much just me being like, I wanted it to have that sort of yeah, urban legend feel. Sorry, that was that was a little rambly, but you get it. <laughs> no, we love it. Well, and as I was reading this, because we took storytelling together, and I remember in, in grad school, and I remember you really enjoyed doing urban legends for your stories. And like, again, like those class days were always days when I was like, these are from the books that terrified me as a small child, but I love sitting here listening to Kayla tell them because I know she's having a grand old time and so <laughs> there were moments like when we when we got to like Simon the cryptid hunter urban legend <laughs> aficionado I was like classic Kayla moment I was yeah. so happy um yeah and I when I started uh reading the book Jeff was like a librarian comes in at true crucial points And so (laughs) thank you for furthering. We talk a lot in the children's department where I work about being total suckers for like, anytime someone writes a picture book where a librarian is a hero, we're like, you have done this to sucker us into buying this book. And you know what? It's about to work. (laughs) So (laughs) every time, yeah. (laughs) I love that you're like, and I'll just pepper in the fact that my profession can help save the day. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is power, kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep your local yearbooks. (laughs) It was funny because I I very much, I like to do sort of a Stan Lee style cameo in my own books sometimes. So Mm -hmm. that was my Stan Lee style cameo where I was like, I'm just going to like put myself in there as a librarian. When you described like the dark black hair, I was like, I remember when Kayla's hair was that color. (laughs) So I sort of wondered that myself. Thank you for confirming. I think there's yeah. there's also like a certain subtlety to the librarian who's like not authoritatively like let me tell you what's really if you'd like to know it's just kind of like sneaking in like more you, things are on the mm, cart you might okay you might like that okay peruse at your very, discretion like it's so obvious that like that's, that's a librarian role written by a librarian <laughs> by somebody who knows what yeah. we actually do yes I was saying I when I originally wrote all of Helena's dialogue. It was very, very reminiscent of how I, I speak, which I can, I don't know, sometimes my style of speaking can be a little bit weird. And my editor flagged all of it and was like, this is um, a very bizarre way for a person to speak. And I'm like, okay, I'll dial it back. Thanks for pointing that out. Called out. Wow. <laughs> wow. Really funny. Uh, all right. So again, the how did we get from wolves to here question? How did you know that a, that an element of this book was going to be that this creaturey, spectrally mysterious, neurosy character was going to be some kind of a, uh, albeit with a cost, a wish granter of sorts. Where did that come in? How did that, and why was that important? I wanted it to be the sort of thing where it emulates kind of a fairly textbook toxic relationship. Oh yeah. Where it seems like on the surface, it's like, like, oh, she's giving us all of this stuff that's so nice of her. And she listens to us. That's part of the reason that Kira likes her so much is that she feels like she's being heard for the first time 
Whereas with, you know, Selena and company, she doesn't get that feeling. Um, and so she kind of gets lulled into this false sense of security so that even when those red flags start coming up, it's like, well, but she did all of those nice things for us. So she, can she really be that evil? Where I think that toxic relationships are just such a core part of the book, both the sort of thing between Selena and Kira and then Kira and Neurosi and the girls and Neurosi and everything is I wanted to write something that like you could sort of track through the book as you realize like oh that's that's what's going on here this is definitely someone who's evil but it's easy at the beginning when someone is being nice to you and listening to you and giving you things to think like oh well they can't be evil because they care about me especially when you're writing about teenage girls a population that sort of as a constituency, people do not tend to be nice or listen to them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think the introduction of Neurosi was especially great because in just in terms of a reader, and I'm not going to spoil it, but you really have no, where, no idea where it's going because Neurosi's introduction is very gentle and friendly, like Casper level sweetness, mm-hmm. like just a friendly ghost. You'd have, you know, who would know? Who would know? So yeah. nice. And that, ah, yes. Yeah, and there's a little bit of that that element of, you know, who me? I can't remember anything. Yes. You know. <laughs> Man, I'm never going to trust a ghost after this book. <laughs> <clears throat> How many yeah, ghosts do you think... go around trusting in your... Maybe you don't want to answer that on no, the mic. Not on mic, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can't reveal that information. Right. <laughs> yeah, if they start asking for body parts, that's when you got to haul out of there. <laughs> hit, hit the bricks. Yeah. Yeah, tell us more though, just about Finch and Selena and their dynamic and how you and how you develop that. And you know, you decide to talk about how talk about the decision to pit them at odds really from the get go. They they don't have a great first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I wouldn't quite call it enemies to lovers, but it's more like a hating to dating situation where I think that I because they're such opposite characters they're very very different people where selena is a very sort of like extroverted um charismatic person who's always down to hang but also is a little bit mean whereas finch is just like very nice and quiet and can be a little bit meek and so i wanted them to clash at first because they only see the sort of bad parts of each other at first and also just because i'm such a sucker for like forcing people who don't like each other to work together so that they slowly have to like figure out that there are parts of each other that they like that's just it's like a fanfic thing that unfortunately has launched itself in my brain and will never ever come out <laughs> so i wanted them to be very very opposite but they start to sort of see parts of each other that make for selena specifically want to be like a little bit better of a person where she sees the way that finch approaches relationships with this sort of sense of earnestness and truthfulness that selena as a person who sort of tends to wear this mask all the time is like oh i want to be more like you and finch sees the way that selena looks at people as like you know not a scary thing they're just like they're like a potential friend or honestly just like more of a less anxiety based way of looking at relationships and she's like i want to emulate that and so they both sort of are able to grow as characters because of their relationship with each other um and it acts as a contrast to the relationship that selena and kira have where they're certainly not growing as people in that situation they're sort of feeding off of each other's um negative traits whereas i wanted to have finch and selena have that very positive relationship that it helps them as people and also as a partnership so that once they do i guess small spoiler enter a romance together it's it's much more um like sweet and wholesome than any other relationships that have been depicted in the book before that when I was at the beginning of the book, because I knew, you know, that they were going to end up together, it, in part because fanfic brain and also because, I mean, I follow you on Instagram. I know what's up. Um, but <laughs> um, I remember thinking, like, how are these two? These guys can't be in the same room together. Like, they can barely talk to each other and make themselves understood. Like, they're constantly, you know, misunderstanding, misunderstanding each other. And by the end, I was like... 
she did it. It's like it's like that scene right. from Jurassic Park where Jeff Goldblum's like, "You crazy son of a bitch, you did it!" Like, exactly. you know, I was by the end, I was like, "They're so cute." Oh my god! And I totally believed it. And I was also really impressed that like Finch comes out over the course of the book, but it doesn't feel like a coming out book. Um, I was going to mention that, yeah. Which I mean, and and then you also get uh, Selena talking about. You know, she's already mostly out, but but talking about her own experiences with that. And I was just like, this is this is the good stuff. This is what like good queer fiction, queer YA especially, you know, can be. Yeah. And not in a way that like, oh, these people just happen to be queer because I'm like, no, I think it matters. You know, I think it matters that this book ends with two girls falling in love instead of a girl and a boy or something. And it's not like an accident, like you did that on purpose. Um, But at the same time, I'm like, it felt very natural. Um, So that's something I really appreciated. There's also that other factor that Finch just has a lot on her plate. We really also have... (laughs) I like that she's like, oh, the fact that I'm a lesbian is like number five on the list. That's like number five. I'm dealing with a lot of stuff right now. Like, I have very low heartbeat. My parents are dead. (laughs) Like, there's an Eldritch monster. Not even necessarily in that order. I guess I'm gay. Right. Like, (laughs) I, I really love that about this book. I can't say why. I can't articulate it, but I loved it. It it really does feel like you know that thing that John Mulaney says. You know, those days when you go, this might as well happen. Like that sort of feels like. (laughs) Like Finch and coming out, she's like, "Oh, well, all right." right. <laughs> Maybe, I'll but deal with this but now. like, and I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm like projecting here, but like, since there is so much uncertainty, like, I don't know what happened to me. I don't know how I got out of the water. I don't know what this ghost thing is. Oh, this is a certainty. This is a check, a box I can check. Yes, mm-hmm. I know this for certain. <laughs> Everything else is chaos. <laughs> well, and even that's sort of the note that the book ends on because it. It ends with, you know, Finch making this note about this this one t- sort of maybe not bit of uncertainty left, but this bit of not fully completeness or, or this bit of ambiguity about the presence of Neurosi in their world. Mm-hmm. But it like but it ends with her and Selena in this very solid place. And I was like, oh, that's such a satisfying ending. Yeah. Come what may. But exactly. I have this moment. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which also, I mean, at one point I loved the the Scooby-Doo references where they show up and Octavia is dressed as Velma and Daphne because especially for me in the second half of the book, it has a very Scooby-Doo feel, Mm -hmm. which I love. The like gang of friends and we're hunting monsters. And in this case, it's not just someone you can pull a paper bag off their head and be like, it was capitalism all along. Um, But you know, it's like, it actually is an Eldritch monster, but we can work with that because we've got a a buddy team of. But the other thing is that there is ostensibly a member of the quote unquote friends group who is taken by the other side yeah. and is now on that other side so there's that demarcation so it's not it's not us against it it's us against it and our friend oh man yeah so yeah the stakes in this novel were incredible yeah <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah that was it was really fun to sort of have kira's arc be her sort of going to the dark side to some degree and like that's another thing. If I was ever able to write a sequel, um, I don't think that Kira is dead. Um, it's I, I think that she's she's got more to her, and I would love to write a sort of um, redemption arc sequel for her because I I love Kira even though she's <laughs> kind of an asshole sometimes. Like she's the worst, but she's the worst so realistically. Like reading her be like mm-hmm. really mean to Finch and Selena, it's like wow. That's a terrible thing to say, but it's a very realistic, terrible thing to say. Yeah. I don't have a question here, but what I also found so fascinating about Selena is that um, it's not as though she ever burned bridges, even though she had relationships gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And she's got a history also with Sumera. I was going to say Sumera a little bit. Right. And then she's got this troubled history with Kira, Mm -hmm. but it's... It's not like an absolutist, I hate her and I'm never going to talk to her ever again. Yeah. I'd still care about her. It was so complex. And mm-hmm. I just loved that, that those complex and uh, rocky relationships were, were very rich. Which is also very true to my own experience of friendships in high school. I mean, like four years is an eternity when you're right. that age. And the way that social groups rearrange themselves. And like, yeah, even people. Right. There are people that, like, I don't speak to now from that time that I'm like, I mean, like, I hope they're doing okay, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. that kind of thing. 
Yeah. Yeah, I just I was curious. To, uh, that's one other facet about Selena. Like, Finch has supernatural baggage, but you made the decision to give Selena this, this other baggage. But, like, talk about how, like, even up to, like, the extreme ending, you can almost be in Selena's head saying, oh, but that's still my friend, Kira. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I actually, that's a good point, Jeff, because I wanted to ask, you mentioned in an early version, you know, it's Selena who's got the supernatural baggage because she's a werewolf. Mm-hmm. I was wondering... Do you remember when you transferred the supernatural baggage to Finch or made that decision? And how did that affect what the story became? Yeah, it was it was interesting because for the longest time, both of them had something going on. So, you know, Finch had her parents' death and coming back from the dead. And in one of the more recent, but not werewolf drafts um, in the past, Selena had gotten these sort of weird powers from summoning Neurosi. Like each of the girls got like a weird power. Um, so I'm trying to remember. She could like teleport or something. I don't know. She could like poke holes in reality and travel through. It was, again, I had to simplify a lot of things when I sold this book because my editor was like, you've got a lot going on. But so I ultimately scaled that back. And so I wanted Selena's character arc to be a little bit more focused on these relationships, because even though um, there is a supernatural element to Neurosi, or she's all supernatural, I suppose, um, I wanted it to be grounded in reality and in those um, relationship dynamics where Neurosi ultimately is like the embodiment of sort of toxic relationships and also of to some degree, the fear of like insecurity that one has when they're a teenager, because so much of what she does is she tr- um, tries to feed on the fact that these girls have these things that they want so desperately, be it being prettier or getting better grades or being more popular, that sort of thing that feels really, really important when you're 16 years old. Um, and so in a way, Like, it feels a little bit cheap to say, but she's a little bit society as well. (laughs) Well, I was going to say, I, there's part of me that kind of appreciates that the narrative sort of treats, you know, say Kira's desperation to be so beautiful with the same, it gives it kind of the same weight as like grades or not being injured, you know, to get into the Boston Conservatory because like society, in terms of society, like beauty does matter. Like there's studies about like pretty privilege and things like that. And that it comes back to like a beautiful woman is maybe more valued by society in certain ways, but is also going to be punished in new and interesting ways um, because that's what we do to women. Uh, and, And I thought that that was like, yeah, you are so desperate for it when you're 16 because it does seem that important and so i do i did appreciate that the book never sort of like treated kira like she was stupid for wanting that Mm -hmm. or that selena was too tough she's one of our heroes and she's okay in the end but she succumbs to it too oh yeah well and as i was reading that scene i remember in high school being at a a rehearsal for the spring musical and one of the girls got a dance injury at rehearsal and like i remember her like hitting the floor like a sack of potatoes wow. and holding her ankle and all of that. And she was ultimately fine before the show went up, but it was really scary, like just to watch. So I can't imagine what it was like for her. And so watching Selena then like run and be like, actually, I will give you my four molars because this is going to help me get into Boston Conservatory. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, within the logic of this story, complete sense. Right. Yeah, that was, I was a dancer in high school. So I put a fair amount of that sort of, of, it's so high stakes in a weird way, (laughs) being a dancer in high school. It feels like so much depends on how hard you can push your body. Um, And so when you lose that, you lose all of your opportunities. And so I wanted to make it really clear that Selena, the way that she sees it is that if she is doesn't make this deal with Neurosi to sort of fix her injury, then she's she would feel worthless and like she had completely lost all of her sort of goals as a person. Whereas I feel like realistically in the future, if I were to like jump forward in these characters' lives 10 years, I don't know if Selena would actually be a dancer. Mm -hmm. I feel like she would probably be doing something else. But at that moment in your life, it feels so intense. And I think that's part of the reason I like writing YA in general is just that 
so many of the emotions that as an adult are fairly pedestrian are so much bigger and more intense when you're 16, 17 years old, because it might be the first time you've dealt with it. And so it feels like the entire world is closing in around you when in fact it's like, oh, I could go to the doctor and get this dealt with and it might not be the end of the world, but it feels like it to you in that moment. Well, yes. And also because like teenage girls have famously normal and okay relationships with their bodies, like whether or not they're dancers. (laughs) So I, you know, add the dancing thing in and it turns it all up to 12 or 13. Right. So... Which is also why this is a scary book. It's It involves body horror. Well, so. and what I, as a non-horror person, enjoyed so much is that, like, yes, there's blood. Mm-hmm. The blood for me is not the terrifying part. It's the it's 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 like Hitchcock. It's what you don't see. Mm-hmm. It's that like oh, there's something living in the tunnels, and like it, it. What is it like for me? The scariest part of the book is when they're like, we don't know what she is. We don't know. Um, And I am a sucker for any sort of like Faustian, we've sold our soul kind of story for this. Um, Because I'm always like, oh, oh." and and now what will happen? Right. Um, But you agreed to this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and yet, you know, the price is even when it's something you agreed to, you don't know what you're agreeing to until the chickens come home to roost. (laughs) Um, So so, yeah, for me, like the the psychological aspect of the horror was the scariest part, but also that doesn't keep me awake at night. So I was able to enjoy it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The I'm scariest, glad. the scariest part of this book is the, the first half where they're like, she's so nice. She gives us the things. real horror was the teenage girls. We were all along. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> um, Kayla, again, congrats on this book. Are you going to like, maybe a stupid question. Do you want to stay in the YA genre? Are you working on anything new lately i am so i have a two book deal with source books so this was my first book um my second book is coming out in april of next year awesome. it's called um this delicious death and it's about a another group of girls who have just graduated from high school um and they decide to go to this sort of fictional version of coachella uh the only problem is is that two years before the start of the book there was this uh sort of cataclysmic event called the hollowing that turned one percent of the population into flesh-eating ghouls (gasps) so all of the girls in this group are ghouls and so they're trying to go to fantasy coachella to have one last hurrah and then they accidentally kill and eat a member of a boy band (laughs) so it's very much the same sort of like campy humor horror that like really warms my heart when i see it in movies and so i was like I'm just going to go crazy and have a lot of fun with it. That this. went in directions I didn't know I needed. I love it. And now I'm like, sign me up for Fantasy Ghoul Coachella. Music is, <laughs> music is still an element. Um, accidental consequences are still an element. That's great. Yes. And horror is still an element. Uh, this, yeah. this book, uh, to repeat, was so compelling. I loved the characters. Also scared me. Satisfyingly so. Uh, but yeah, well done. Yeah, I love that we can come on the pod and be like, listeners, whether you love horror like Jeff or do not typically read it like Mary Graham, yeah. either way, read this book. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm so glad that you guys liked it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And thanks for joining us to chat, too. Of course, anytime. That was our chat with Kayla Cottingham. We're going to have a link to her website in the show notes. Uh, Boston-based author with her debut horror novel, My Dearest Darkest. Mary Graham, it's great to have you on the podcast. Always great to be here, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, you've listened to another episode of A Little Too Quiet. We always appreciate you tuning in to listen to uh, us talk to authors sometimes. We, we've, we've had a lot of conversations where staff are rambling about book-centric and book-adjacent topics, but today we had an author interview, so thanks for tuning in. The music that you hear at the beginning and end of each episode is by local musician John Duffy, and of course, this podcast is brought to you by our dear sweet friends of the Ferndale Library, and if you want to support us or them, go to ferndalefriends.org, and please remember to rate, review, or subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back next week with more. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.